As a millennial, I've long thought that we understand all the things that we interact with. But I've come to realize that in the past nine years that I've been debating competitively, and in the past two years that I've been running an, a youth-based organization that centered at capacity building, that we as individuals don't engage with matters at an early stage within our lives, particularly as males. We don't specifically engage how we influence the environment that we find ourselves in, and we don't interrogate how we can be better with regards to how we engage those environments. I've seen a distinction, however. When it comes to individuals who come from private schools, as I've experienced in the time I've spent uh, teaching individuals, I've seen that individuals from private schools engage matters at a very young age, and you'll find someone in grade nine having a firm grasp of concepts such as feminism. Whereas on the other hand, you'd have an individual from a government school not engaging such a concept until they're, until they're in university. I am not an exception to that rule. I was a skinny boy from a, a, a government school in Kitman's Whoop, and I only got to engage with these concepts at the very later stage in my life. I remember walking into a debate at my first ever South African National University Debate Championships, and an individual was talking about masculinity. So what did I know about masculinity at that point in time? I knew that you are either masculine or you are feminine. Beyond that, I didn't understand what it was. But I've come to realize that masculinity is a supposed attribute that we assign to males that make us more desirable as males. So it might be leadership, decisiveness, or strength, because supposedly these attributes are unique to what it means to be a man. It was in that same tournament that I met an individual who was talking about this powerful construct called patriarchy. So at that point in time, this person had spent, and if you are familiar with debating, had spent approximately five to seven minutes of their time blaming the world's problems on patriarchy. I remember sitting there and wondering, wow, patriarchy must be one strong man if you can blame it for everything in the world. But I've come to realize that patriarchy and what it is, is that it's a system that enables male domination. It's somewhat a system that benefits males without merit at all. So when we find ourselves as males in a job, in an interview, and we get the job over a woman that's more qualified than we are, we often say, no, I just got lucky. No, we didn't. It's very often the patriarchy and how it functions. So we might think, and as the time has developed, I've come to question, so what is wrong with masculinity and patriarchy in itself? So we might think, it's not so bad. It's merely a couple of attributes that are desirable that we need to have as males. But these two concepts have, through socialization and reinforcement, gathered and formed this destructive construct that's much more powerful than just a simple code of masculinity. And they have formed to create hypermasculinity, which is an over-exaggeration of certain male stereotypes. So you might say, no, Johannes, this is an exaggeration. It's not that bad. We find ourselves in a world where we had recently the first female candidate in one of the superpowers of the world for presidency. We find ourselves in a world where Africa has two sitting female presidents, or at least one now. And we find ourselves in a world where human rights have made significant impact in lives, so it can't be as bad as you say it as Johannes. But to recontextualize it, we find ourselves in a world where we have conventions that are specifically tailored to tackle the abuses that are faced by women and children. We find ourselves in a country where we have an act that specifically seeks to tackle gender-based violence. We find ourselves in a country that is neighbored by a country that has some of the highest uh, rape ra rates in the world. Clearly, there is something wrong with this brand of masculinity and the interactions we have as males uh, with uh, the opposite sex. 
It kind of bears semblance with this world that's described by Chinua Achebe and Chimamanda Adichie in, cert in, their cert in, certain, in certain books of theirs. A world in which, where we are overtly violent towards females, where males are overly entitled to certain things, but thirdly, a world where masculinity is so fragile that it can't be questioned and attempt to change it in any way. So it made me realize that we are at the point where we need to deconstruct, we need to unlearn, and we need to relearn certain attributes and constructs that are attributed to masculinity. That's where me and a friend of mine started an organization that is centered around or attempting to deconstruct these certain ideals. So we do it at three levels in particular. Firstly, we look at male strength, sexualization, and as well, emotion as a weakness. That's how we are taught as males. So it's a three-stage interrogation. So on the first issue here, male strength, what are we taught in particular? We are taught that as a man, you need to be strong and be assertive in your power, supposedly. That you can't show any signs of weakness. The problem with this in particular is that it is ta it's taught with little guidance. And how it often manifests itself is by way of aggression and violence. If you need a practical example of it, just look at a playground in any school scenario and look at who's more prone to get into a physical altercation. It's the male child. Because of this concept of strength that we are taught, but isn't particularly taught in a context. If you have to look further on to a more relatable example, as a boy, if you got into an argument at school and you came back home, very often the first question you're asked is, how does the other guy look? Or if you came home crying, then very often you are told, let's go back. <laughs> you won't come into my house crying. So what we do at our organization, the second question we ask ourselves is, where does this particular thing stem from? Because we need to question, does it have a place in the society we find ourselves? So male strength as a construct made sense in an African society where we had to defend the land, which wasn't done very successfully, by the way. A society where we were very often warriors and we had to defend from possible attacks from a neighbor or from someone trying to take over your territory. This was a context under which male strength was taught and was very necessary. So the first thing we need to ask ourselves now in particular is, why does it need to change in particular? It's because the way it's taught to the present day generation is in one way that is not necessarily contextualized. It's one that's very broad and leads to the assumption that you need to apply this brand of male strength to each and every scenario you find yourself in. And that's very problematic because as males, we now tend to attempt to resolve every problem with strength. But I've also come to think and I've noticed that male strength doesn't necessarily have a place in the 21st century. Male strength has been usurped by technology. Everything you needed to use your power on before has been replaced by some technological instrument. It bears to ask the question, whether there is necessarily a place for this construct, and bring in mind all these harms that come with it, I don't think there is. So the second thing that, at our organization, that we attempt to interrogate is this idea of male sexualization. So what I've come to realize is that, as males, we are from a very young age sexualized into believing that we, our identity is branded by having sex. We are taught from a very young age that having multiple sexual partners is the it thing to do, and that's what makes you a man. So let's look at a practical example that I think a lot of males here can relate to. Very often, an uncle of yours, or even your father, would take you out and introduce you to all these aunts. Every second or third week, you have a new aunt in your life. And you being naive, what often happens is that at the next family gathering, you start questioning and asking where your aunts are. And your uncles only laugh and they tell you to keep quiet. Later on, when you are in your teenagehood, you come to realize that those weren't your, those weren't your aunts. 
those were very often the partners of that uncle or your father. But the problem is, at this stage when you have to interrogate it, it's a point in time where you are taught that being a player and being a lover are things that you need to aspire to. So you do little deconstructing and you don't really question it. All that happens is that it becomes a part of who you are and how you supposedly should be as a male. So the thing we need to ask ourselves then, in particular, is where does this stem from? It stems from an African society, or certain African societies, where women were viewed as mere ornaments, properties, tools. In societies where a man's wealth was often attributed to the amount of children he had. So causally, the more women you had, the more children you could have. And very importantly, a context under which where males had a monopoly over sex. We dictated when sex happened and how it happened and with who it happened. So now we need to ask thirdly, why does it need to change and does it have a place in the society we find ourselves now? My answer is no, it doesn't have a place here because one, we are in a society where males don't have a monopoly over sex anymore due to the, the development of human rights and females having developed an autonomy over their own bodies. And secondly, where you have a concept such as sexualization that leads men to relying on this male strength to access that thing, it's very clear that it hasn't have a place here. So why is it that individuals tend to rely on this male strength? It's because, just like male strength, it isn't contextualized. So when you are taught sexualization, it isn't taught in a context where you might get the answer no. It's taught as a categorical, something that you can access at any point in time. It's your God-given right as a male to have sex. So what happens in particular is now that males, when they are growing up in this particular instance, or should I say, we as males, is that we grow up with an entitlement to this particular sex. And when we are denied that sex, we rely on the other thing we are taught, male strength, to access that particular thing. So it's important we deconstruct that idea or completely remove it because it doesn't have a place in the society we find ourselves. The last thing in terms of hypermasculinity that we need to interrogate and to deconstruct is this idea that emotion is a weakness within the male identity. Very often growing up, you are told as a child, every time you are sad or you want to cry or you are in a situation that purports to weakness, you are told, don't be a girl. We are continuously taught that we need to suppress our emotions and that we can't put our emotions out there because it weakens who we are as males. What does this do in particular? It has led to us males just being individuals who've pent up aggression and insecurities that we don't particularly deal with. Because we are taught these are things that we can't talk about because it lessens your identity as a man in particular. So what do I say? I see that we need to deconstruct and change these ideals as to what it means to be a masculine man. Because by doing that, it will be much better and much easier for us males in how we interact with each other, but more importantly, with how we interact with, other, with females. It's important to note that as males, it starts with us. And the moment we do that, we can make a better world. Thank you.